This is The Final Word with Jeff Lemon and Adam Collins, a weekly cricket podcast that is sometimes many more than one time per week. Uh, hello, Adam. And you look like it, you, it's not 40 degrees where you are anymore, thankfully. No, it, it's raining. It's uh, it's grim in Melbourne, but I'll be joining you in Queensland. In fact, I think we're ships in the night. I'm going back to Queensland while you're coming back to Melbourne, and then we will meet again mm. in, in the... Uh, what's Melbourne? It's not, the, it's not the Garden City anymore, is it? It was the Garden City when we were growing up. It's called something else now, but... It was the Garden State, wasn't Garden it? Garden State, that's what it was, sorry. On the number plates. Um, but then that also became a hit indie film, and so then, <laughs> you know, then they, then they had to change it through. The, I'm pretty sure Jeff Kennett had about 10 different cringeworthy sort of motivational poster slogans. Victoria, on the move. I remember that one. On was the a, move. The place to be was the other one. I think that I think the place to be might have been a, a Braxy initiative. I quite like that one. But anyway, that's where we'll be together uh, soon enough. But no, not 40 degrees in, in Melbourne today. I am pleased to hear it. I'm also pleased that we've had... an. Absolutely remarkable response the last um, week or so to our interview with Marcus Stoinis, um, all the credit for which has to go to him. But I, I don't think we've ever had a reaction like that um, to the number of people getting in touch to tell us really personal things to tell us how the different ways they were moved by it, what it meant to them, um, how it helped them see things differently in their own lives or, or have some sense of kinship in in grief or um, find some little moment of closure. There was a lot of really special messages over the last week. Yeah, there was. So there's, I suppose there's two parts to this. There's the amazing outpouring uh, of emotion from people who listened to it. As you say, a lot of people who'd lost parents prematurely and who'd felt uh, this deep connection to what Marcus was talking to us about. Uh, there's the very fact that he was willing to tell us that story uh, in such uh, in such an open way, which we're so grateful for. And then I suppose there's the sheer volume of human beings who listen to that program. We've had more people listen to that episode of the show than any ep in the history of The Final Word, and it's only been out for about four or five days at the time we're recording this. So that means more people listen to it than the final day at Headingley, the Leeds Miracle, than the Nasser Hussain interview, than the World Cup final even that night on the balcony there. So this is touching people and reaching people who don't normally listen to cricket podcasts. And I suppose that's reflective of the fact that it wasn't really a cricket conversation. Uh, so again, our enduring thanks to Marcus for... Uh, being such a phenomenal guest and being able to not just tell the story of his dad, by the way, but another part of the interview that really cut through was the final stanza when he was talking about um, the idea of being a good man as distinct from being a good bloke. A number of people have written to us saying that young men across Australia and across the world for that matter should should listen to that message that it's more important to be a good man than to be seen as a good bloke and, and the way he drew that distinction in a really quite eloquent way towards the end of the conversation and of course that's informed by his relationship with his father as well and it all ties together beautifully but yeah amazing response and we're proud to have uh, been able to have had that conversation. That's in the feed if you haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. Um, it's not just recommended by us, but by many other people. So yes. that's a decent endorsement. Uh, quite a big show today. We've got an interview with Dr. Chelsea Watego, who's an Indigenous woman who's uh, an academic who's speaking to us about January 26 and the stories going around this week around Cricket Australia and removing the Australia Day badging from their uh, games that are being played on Jan 26, which is when we're recording this show as well. Uh, Sri Lanka playing England, that series, that brief series, um, just wrapping up over there last night as we're recording this um, and a few... Other bits and pieces going around with South Africa, Pakistan are set to start. A bit of nerd pledge in the back half, um, various things going along. It's good to start the show with an early nomination for a Seabus Super Performer of the Week. We will talk about <laughs> Sri Lanka and England later, but I wanted to throw this one to Giuseppe Root because this this is a guy who's constantly been sledged for not turning 50s into 100s um, and then back to back he's gone double ton followed by a 180 um, although I did look at his his scores he's gone past 180 eight times and only got 200 four times so bad conversion rate from 180 to 200 Joe Root <laughs> and of course the message here is don't throw away your innings in retirement visit cbussuper.com.au forward slash the final word we mentioned it last week during the Marcus mm. Stoinis interview but now we've received incredible 
support from Sea Bus Super over a long period of time in keeping the final word on the tracks and keeping us out uh, in the feeds a couple of times a week. And certainly the, the daily shows we made uh, between Australia and India wouldn't have been possible without Sea Bus Super. So take a look at seabussuper.com.au forward slash the final word. There's a landing page there where you can learn a lot more about superannuation. And if you haven't got your super sorted out, no no better time than now, the start of a fresh year um, to get your finances in order. And of course, past performance is no reliable indicator of future performance. And get yourself a PDS <laughs> on that website, cbussuper.com.au. Oh, you are enjoying yourself so much there. I've never seen you so pumped up on any segment <laughs> on the show. So I suppose we should start by summarising what went on with Cricket Australia during the week. This was an interesting one because, you know, it was a very understated uh, sort of move from CA. They just put out a press release saying only that they were not going to be using Australia Day as the sort of branding, the badging for the Big Bash games that are being played on Jan 26, which, you know, in the past, generally, when there's been cricket on that day, it's always been about Australia Day at the cricket, you know, the the the, the famous Australia Day one-day game at the Adelaide Oval that happened for, you know, a number of years back to back and, and so on. And they decided not to do that on the uh, recommendation of their Indigenous Advisory Council that um, the January 26 is a day that sucks pretty hard if you're an Indigenous person or um, if you, indeed, if you just have empathy for other human beings, which seems to be um, kind of too much for, for some people in our uh, political spectrum and commentary out to, to grasp. But, and so predictably, even though it was the most understated move, they got smashed up for it the prime minister jumped in the usual suspects um jumped in behind to say that it was that it was disappointing and that they and that cricket australia should stay out of politics and as if as if politics and sport don't exist in the same world to begin with but as if it's also not a political move to choose to use that phrasing and that terminology given all that we know about it as well um i don't know what did you make of the last week or so yeah, well, well. first of all, I think that the announcement from Cricket Australia, because it was first seeded by one of the big bash clubs, it meant that it kind of happened all in a hurry, and I don't think they necessarily got the clear air they needed to explain it in full, but that's no criticism of Cricket Australia. They've absolutely done the right thing here. And basically, in response, they got a good old-fashioned stick to sport from the Prime Minister. Um, condescending, kind of stick to your knitting. Um, you worry about the cricket stuff, fellas. You just lost... You know, do you reckon he would have said that you just worry about cricket had they beat India three days earlier? Of course he wouldn't have. So there was a, a cynical edge to what he said. He followed it up in a press conference when um, discussing the first fleet and that comment that jarred so uh, so much about... Uh, what did he say? It was a pretty rough time for those on the first fleet as well, or words to that uh, effect. I believe it. I believe it was. Um, it it wasn't a very flash. It wasn't day a very flash for, day. For yeah. those on the, so doing a bit yeah. of so yeah, a bit of your classic whataboutism uh, meshed in there too. And it was the same day that Margaret Court. Uh, it was, so it was announced was receiving her AC. I mean, there was a lot going on here in the culture wars. Just as the federal government like it, just as a particular breed of conservative politician loves it, he would have um, been enamoured with the fact that Cricket Australia had made this decision because it gave him the chance to to talk to his base and more still you know, kick along this idea um, that there are deep divisions in the community around this and that suits him down to the ground so politically that was what was going on where I found it distressing though was that um, Dan Christian tried to uh, engage with the PM on Twitter so Dan Christian he's been on the show talked about the reconciliation action plan with us probably this time last year and he you know didn't you know snarly way, not in a disrespectful way. He just engaged the Prime Minister to explain um, why what he had said in response to CA's announcement wasn't going to work for Indigenous people, not least himself. And the response to that was a total fucking pile-on, an absolute, um, you know, the fash uh, single went up in the sky and, and, they, and they came hunting down Christian on, on social media. Um, we saw even members of the Senate, uh, a Queensland numpty who's in the Senate for the LNP, he piled in on top of Dan Christian, which meant that he was in a position where he was almost apologising for his comments, which he doesn't need to do. Dan Christian is a strong, articulate Indigenous man who doesn't need to like apologise for having a view to people who uh, to people who are undermining uh, his position 
as as cynically and in such bad faith as they were. So that played out for a couple of days on, on social media, and so it has on, on Australia Day, as it is, as it's still called today, um, while the cricket's taking place in the Big Bash. But I must say, it was a fairly unflattering um, sort of response to what I hoped at the time, anyway, would be received in the spirit that it had been announced. But that perhaps was... Uh, uh, that, that for, for my part, I, I was, um, I was uh, expecting too much, I think. The credibility of some of the people involved is, is non-existent when... You know the the centre that, uh, that you're talking about is the bloke running conspiracy theories that the Bureau of Meteorology is involved in a massive international cover up to pretend that you know climate change is happening. Like the, the, this is a um, someone whose ideas are, are out of their tree. And I also noted this as a fellow who got um, 1,176 votes at the last election. That's how many people voted for him, which is um, fewer votes than Dan Christian has made runs in the Big Bash. So in terms of, in terms of credibility, it's not really there, um, particularly up against someone like Dan Christian. So it's fine to um, turn around and tell Cricket Australia that they shouldn't be involving themselves in anything like this, but it's not fine to tell the lunatic members of your own party room who are saying that you should be injecting bleach or whatever it is to cure yourself of COVID. That's that's all good. That's a freedom of speech um, yeah. <laughs> imperative as as far as these people are concerned. And this had another layer as well. Mark Latham, uh, uh, for example, was then saying that Mel Jones should have to hand back her Australia Day honour from a couple of years ago because of the, the views that Australia... The, the views that had been uh, uh, articulated around Margaret Court. And like the whole thing got so muddied up. Uh, and by the end of it, I mean, again, Gideon Haig put it best on offsiders a couple of days ago. It, it was it was no more than right-wing trolling, uh, what was going on late last week around the culture wars and around the 26th of January and around speaking to a certain group of Australians who they like to fire up at this time of year. And we shouldn't mistake ourselves by what was going on there. The framing of everything as a debate all the time is one of the great misnomers. There's never a debate. It's only ever about um, signalling, about firing up certain flares into the sky to, yeah. to let, let let certain groups know where to rally. But I, I did think it was uh, significant that CA's move, I thought, gave the necessary public support that um, Dan Christian and uh, Josh Layla as well a couple of Indigenous players, and, and most Indigenous cricketers are, are pretty wary about saying anything too publicly on any issue related to this because because they know where it can go, they know how badly it can go wrong, they know that sticking your head up above the parapet um, can end up badly for you. But those two did come out and make strong comments during the week and back them up and were prepared to do so, and I it... You know, I, I haven't been uh, had the opportunity to ask either of them about it, but my guess is that they would have felt much more able to do that given CA's move was publicly and positively backing Indigenous cricketers um, and that they felt like they had explicit support from CA at that point, not just sort of implicit support. Yeah, I think that's, that's well put. And, and CA should be commended for the work they've done now. Over a number of years, I mean, whether it's in participation, which has grown and swelled from, I think it's... Was it 20 years ago, there were 7,000 Indigenous Australians playing cricket, now it's closer to 70,000. It's been a huge uptick, especially in, in recent summers. And, you know, the reconciliation action plan, there's been two versions of that now. Um, the advisory council, to which you referred to earlier on, um, this is not a tokenistic exercise from CA. They are all in on this. Um, there's a story that's going up shortly from Daniel Bredig and myself on Crick Info discussing um, the fact that CA wanted the PM's 11 uh, last year to be an all-Indigenous team and unfortunately um, that didn't happen. But the very fact that they had that idea and that initiative to uh, have an all-Indigenous side represent uh, the PM's 11 is emblematic, I think, of where CA have, are at at the moment. And look, they've not been without criticism. We've had conversations about um, Cricket Australia in, in recent weeks and, and some of the comments that Chelsea makes with us later on um, about some of the more tokenistic elements of this. But on the whole, um, they are now out there and making public statements routinely, and that can only be in the long for the long term uh, betterment of, uh, of Indigenous Australians who want to be involved with cricket. Yeah, well, I, I think we should move on to that now. I, I appreciate there may be people listening to the show who don't really share the view that we have and who look at this and say, well, you know, what's the big deal about January 26? Why do we have all these arguments about Australia Day? You know, 
uh, the kind of ideas that you hear about unity and healing and moving forward and, and all the rest of it. And, you know, I appreciate that people have those perspectives. I think that you might end up learning something with Dr. Chelsea Watego. So let's go to that now. This is The Final Word with Jeff Lemon and Adam Collins. We're very happy to welcome to the show today Dr. Chelsea Watego from the Munanjali clan of the Ugambe people. She's the associate professor, uh, an associate professor, probably not the one, at the University of Queensland, academic and, and health worker. Um, and uh, having done a doctorate in this field, Chelsea, first of all, thank you very much for making time to be on the show. No problem. Thanks for having me. We're speaking to you on January 26, which made me slightly worried that I thought, you know, when January 26 rolls around each year, I'm guessing that some part of you must be having a massive eye roll and thinking, oh God, do we have to do all of this again? When, you know, it's 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 a time for such superficial and unhelpful arguments and under the guise of debates that just seems to be the same stuff year after year. But I'm not sure if that's how you see it, but I, I thought that you might. Yeah, well, look, I refuse to write op-ed pieces around the date and you get the invitations every year. Someone wants you to write something about it. And I kind of don't read the articles that do get put out at this time because they're typically ones we've read before and they offer nothing new. I was interested in having this yarn today just because I've been interested in, around race and sport and from all my criticism of Crypt Australia's Barefoot Yarning Circle or whatever that thing was... This time, though, has brought a, a conversation that's been a really important one to have and in terms of the match today not being called the Australia Day match and the Prime Minister's mm. response and then the subsequent response to that. So that really interested me, that conversation and, and what's going on there. And I'm interested in talking about settler colonialism because we have to deal with it every day, but I'm interested more in conversations that take us somewhere and make us think differently rather than same old articles for clickbait every year. Yeah, that was the initial jumping off point that made us think that we wanted to speak to you about this um, th this this interesting situation where so Cricket Australia have an Indigenous advisory body now who who advised that using the term Australia Day in a celebratory way wasn't appropriate given that uh, I suppose some of our listeners are overseas and might not know the background of this story. 26th of January gets celebrated as Australia Day, but it's also the, you know, it's, it, that's because it's the anniversary of the date of white arrival in Australia, which means it's also the anniversary of the date of Indigenous dispossession and genocide, the start of, of that process that, that goes on to this day. So the idea of using it as a celebratory occasion seems pretty epically tone deaf to to people who are willing to actually uh, listen to that side of of the argument but it's curious thing that so cricket australia made this move which was which was a very low key move and you often i'm sure you know you've had this plenty of times that the sort of tone policing in the debates that say that says that if you want to achieve something you can't be too pushy about it or too aggressive and you have to go about it in the right way and all that sort of stuff well this ca move was very very low key they just put out a press release and said we won't be specifically using this term in marketing was about all that it, it amounted to and yet that still copped a backlash that still got the prime minister specifically saying that the cricket australia should be staying out of politics which is curious given he's been very keen to be involved with cricket as a political tool when it's been useful so that's the situation for those people who don't know and yeah i'm, I'm wondering how you read it as it unfolded over the last week or so yeah. Look, I, I had to make a disclaimer, a few disclaimers, actually. One is I don't watch cricket. I played it on Christmas Day it's as a kid compulsory. growing up. <laughs> also, um, the other disclaimer is around the Indigenous Advisory Committee, so I'm not familiar with the committee. And so my critiques around what cricket does is not a critique around the individual's on the Indigenous Advisory Committee, because I am conscious as a black fella, when the word advisory is in the title, it means that you may not get listened to and you may not get what you want. And so we have lots of Indigenous Advisory Committees for all kinds of things, from the police service um, to sporting associations. Right. And so I'm, I'm conscious of the, the position that those people are in with the kind of environment we have to work in, which is extremely conservative. On the international stage, Australia is extremely conservative. While the rest of the world is having their global Black Lives Matter moments, we have a PM that says slavery didn't exist. 
that things weren't too flash for the settlers. And a member of parliament invokes a racial slur of Aboriginal people as petrol sniffers. Like, this is the time we're in right now. This is the sophistication of the conversations around race and Indigenous peoples in this place. So just context, I guess, for this. So what was, I was reading an op-ed this morning from Andrew Webster, he's a sports writer with Sydney Morning Herald, and he runs the line that, you know, it's an admirable move, however, it was too quick because we can't have quick change at all, you know, like... And he uses the language of ambush. The, the settlers were ambushed by this move. I mean, mm. black fellas right now are talking, like, really? Ambush is the language you would use to describe renaming an event. And it's still January 26th. It's still on the day. It's just not using that word. It's almost funny to hear the resistance to such a moderate change. Going back a couple of months to when you uh, wrote about uh, cricket and race and uh, looking at the barefoot circles, at the time, I think that people were watching uh, those events on television. They saw that as a, a really important step in the right direction. But you came at it from a different perspective. We, we talked about it on the final word then, but it'd be great to get you to add to that and articulate why you thought that hit a bung note. Well, we saw it, it was Cricket Australia and also Rugby Union who, um, and so it's only the sports in, in, in this country that were on the international stage that were kind of having these conversations. And that's because other um, nation sporting teams were taking a knee in support of Black Lives Matter. And here in the colony, even that's seen as outrageous. But Australia was being shamed on the international stage because we've been revealed as the, the racist outpost that we are. And so, you know, the powers that be kind of go, well, what do we do instead of taking a knee to give the appearance that we care about race without even talking explicitly about race and instead let's talk about culture. And we appreciate culture. The very one we wiped out, almost tried wipe out, I should say. That's the context here is that these cultural ceremonies that were created by in, with Rugby Union and with Cooking Australia were our response to Black Lives Matter. And that's so important here because those events should have been an opportunity to have some really honest, hard conversations about race. And, you know, not long after, look what happens at the Sydney game and the claims of uh, racial slurs being directed at the Indian cricket players. Imagine if we used that before that actually talked about race and how, we'd be, how we could be like courageous around race and racism in sport. The concern was is that while the rest of the world are talking about race in really honest ways, here we were trying to find ways to avoid those conversations while knowing it is ever present in every sport in this place. Um, as a black fella growing up, it's, it was always in sport. Even in rugby league where there were so many black fellas playing, you, you always heard it on the sidelines. You sat in the stands. You had to listen to this stuff. Mm. And it was all fun and the boys just joking over beers, you know. So this is just so every day in this place. And um, so I think it was unfortunate that there was this detour away from race to, to talk about cultural appreciation in a way that was this universal Indigenous culture that was not grounded to a specific place because we have hundreds of different nations in this on this continent, yeah. hundreds that are diverse, our own language groups. And um, so these kind of one ceremony fits all this doesn't actually honour properly the, the nations that are here and are still here. Mm. And and the nations where those games particularly are taking place rather than a, a more sort of treating it as a more generic thing. Yeah. And we've all, you know, if, and this is not just in sport, it's every institution, you know, there's kind of this how do we give the appearance that we're mm. doing the right thing without committing to actual change? Um, and so we've had this in Indigenous Affairs for some time. It's the, the change without change. It's like the anthem change. No one asked for the anthem to be changed from young to one. And, in fact, young is more truthful than one anyway. This is a young nation in terms of the idea of Australia. It is very young compared to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations that have been here for 60,000 years. Mm. But to call us one is far more offensive because we're not one. And we've lived in this continent as hundreds of nations, right? So we know about coexistence. We don't have to live in a, in a world that we then absorb everyone to become one. Mm. We can coexist. And that's the really, I think, unfortunate part about this time is there's this refusal to see coexistence as a legitimate way of being. 
that we can coexist if we recognise each other properly rather than this idea of this national inclusiveness which we get absorbed into and we forget what it is that makes us who we are. The end goal of settler colonialism, for those who study it, the end goal of settler colonialism, where the settlers come and they stay and they never go home, the end goal for them is to make sure that the Indigenous peoples forgot that they were ever Indigenous. Mm. So when you see in the protests today, in the images you'll see on social media, you'll see signs like hashtag still here. This is the Indigenous response to the settler colonial project. Mm. We're saying we're still here. We still want to be recognised as independent nations and the challenge then for the rest of this country who who claim to love it so much is how can we coexist in this place recognizing recognizing that without needing to absorb us and and insist that we forget who we are and where we came from particularly when this land is the land that we became human in there's a well, first of all, we, we talk to a lot of people who aren't from Australia on this podcast, so the discussion around January 26 may not quite um, necessarily uh, be one they're, they're familiar with. And on top of that, you see uh, many bad faith actors who like to point at January 26 and say, well, nothing really happened that day anyway, so why do we make such a fuss each year about the supposed invasion, etc., etc., etc.? Boring arguments, but nevertheless, for the record, what started happening on the 26th of January 1788. What was that the starting off point for, for the Indigenous communities who had to experience what was happening on their soil? I mean, of course, 26th of January means different things for different nations because of the location that we're in. Uh, According to the Prime Minister, I think it was 12 ships arrived. We're still searching for that missing one. Uh, The the challenge, I think, of thinking about 26th of January as the point of invasion, uh, one level is that the colonial project is ongoing. It's every day. And so what you're seeing in, the, in what, how blackfellas are talking about this day, there is a resistance about this is not about change the date. This is about changing a nation and the ideals that the nation is founded upon, which for, for a long time was a white nation. And, and this country was very explicit about that for some time. Uh, there's no question there. And there are still many Australians who are committed to the idea who haven't relinquished that idea of a white Australia. So I think there's a challenge with the focus on the date because when we talk about colonisation, we're talking about it as it plays out still right now. When, you know, uh, and not that I'm uh, necessarily a, a fierce advocate for the Uluru Statement, but when you see a national consultation take place in which a fairly moderate proposal is put forward, that the Prime Minister of the day refers to that as a radical, a, you know, a radical proposal. And it was one of coexistence. It was one of how do we reconcile the relationships here and maintain them as an ongoing thing. So I think there's a challenge with fighting over dates and events because colonisation is not one event. It is an ongoing process all the time. So you mentioned coexistence a couple of times, which I think is really interesting in terms of like how how the idea of, of a nation working is, you know, how, how that's viewed, where even a a more, say, a a political position that might regard itself as more progressive would still hold up this ideal of, like, unity, you know, the nation has to heal and become one, but that still relies on it being one sort of nation, you know, of the sort that has been prescribed to Indigenous people that they're supposed to join that or sort of be absorbed into that rather than, as you speak about, being able to coexist alongside one another in in a in a different sort of way is, is that part of the challenge of trying to get um you know, that, that it's not just people who are sort of racially antagonistic who have an idea that doesn't fit about how things should and and would and could be yeah i think um and it's just not to sort of to talk in false binaries but there's a difference between colonizing people and people who are relational um, so I remember um, I knew Dr Lilla Watson um, talking to me about the fact that Aboriginal people were never a colonising people. So, you know, those big, you see the big language map of Australia with all the different language groups and there's hundreds. Have you seen that colourful map? Yeah. And she's like, when people colonise a place, the first thing they do is they take over the language. Now, you have to look at that map and see mm. so many different language groups coexisting on one continent. That's coexistence. 
So there were rules for uh, around boundaries, around who could do what. You know, there's rules I still follow about what I can do on someone else's country and what I can't do. Blackfellas are still living this, this idea of coexistence, of respect for other people's country, about how you behave in someone else's country, how you care for someone else, um, and the limitations of what you can and can't do. Colonising people don't have limitations. Everything is to be acquired, possessed, extracted, taken without protocol, without rules. We look at last year the desecration of sacred sites over in Western Australia. And that's in 2020. And they knew it was a sacred site and they destroyed it to extract from it. And so it's how do we get this nation thinking about what it means to coexist in this place. And it's only by engaging with Indigenous peoples and knowledges that we might come to understand that. But if you are committed to the idea that Aboriginal people are racially inferior, then you'll refuse to learn anything from us. Mm. And this is, this is why we need to talk about race in as much as we talk about culture. And so there's this idea of thinking of us as quaint, exotic that sit over there and are brought out during Invasion Day or NAIDOC Week, mm. as opposed to maybe there's ways of knowing, being and doing this place that we could offer this nation in order to make it better. And so it's changing that relationship. And we're still a long way to come, particularly with the kind of leadership we have here where the PM refuses to denounce one of his own members of his party referring to us as petrol sniffers. Mm. And... It, look, when you're talking about such a broad and complex need for, uh, I guess, a change in the way that, that a society operates um, and, and certainly how different parts of it relate to one another, it seems to me that, that things like bickering about January 26 and whatever it is, the sniping and so on that goes on, all of that feels completely useless in that context because it's such a it's like getting people distracted by the easiest thing to think about you know should you change this date or not as opposed to here is the far more complex thing that we have to grapple with and which we're still refusing to grapple with we're still refusing to kind of think about how we have a relationship with each with each other and i always find it interesting so particularly in the sporting arena everyone loves new zealand And the fact that they have the haka and it's like, look, they're proud of their Indigenous peoples and we should have something like that. And they've all kind of wanted to have that thing. And it's like, well, they've got a treaty. Hmm. Like, there's a reason why it's different. And not that their treaty is perfect, but they have have some sort of mechanism that where, where parties agree that that needs to be negotiated. And so it's funny, I find it funny to look to other, other countries and go, we want that. But it's like, oh, hang on, but that means you've got to do the work too. You can't just take the dance without doing the work. And we're not going anywhere. Black fellas aren't, aren't going anywhere. And there's no sense of ever forgetting who we are and where we come from. I grew up in a household where my father routinely said, never forget who you are and where you come from. And my kids live in a house where they're told that. Um, so we're not going anywhere. So why not Why not sit and have these conversations in a meaningful way? Not just at kitchen tables, but in the floors of parliament. Why can't we have these genuine conversations? I mean, I have yet to hear a black fellow say, go back to where you came from or fuck off a fool. Mm. Yet to hear that. We're asking for coexistence. It really isn't all that radical. In fact, it's quite generous that that's the position we're, we're working from. What's your perspective on the tenor of this conversation over perhaps the last quarter of a century? I mean, often there's been reflections upon the Keating government, for example, the Redfin speech, etc., as a reference point, as a point in time when these conversations were being had, when the argument was being advanced and whether it's regressed or, or whether it's not regressed, whether society has actually kept up pace and, and that there's these higher profile moments where, uh, where leaders haven't stepped up to the mark, but on the whole, we're trending in the right direction. Where do you come at this from? Look, I mean, I think the Howard year is particularly devastating and this is coincides with Hanson. So I'm in high school during Keating, yep. coming out of senior high school, sorry, we're, we're entering into Howard. Hanson, I remember the her maiden speech to Parliament mm. and I remember the turn. I remember as a young adult in uni just constantly getting, like constantly people suddenly gave, had their racism had a place to breathe more freely than what it had before. 
the abolishment of ADSIC, um, which and, and which saw the closing down of a whole lot of community organisations that were doing really important work. And now we have this the era of new paternalism and Indigenous affairs and closing the gap, which has a decade-long record of failure, yet we're still committing to it. We are in extremely conservative times, and even our Indigenous voices from Indigenous media to our peak bodies who are funded by this conservative government are being silenced through that. And so I've been really disappointed that the peaks have signed up to say the closing the gap agreement refresh and the way in which even uh, Indigenous media are representing some of these conversations in very conservative ways. This is a really challenging time. At the same time, what's been exciting has been the, the black resistance. I remember marching on 26th of January, it was hundreds of people in Brisbane, if that. So, We've seen this, this rise in a very conservative politics and it's certainly been very challenging in, uh, for Indigenous communities and Indigenous affairs more broadly. But at the same time, the refusal of blackfellas to accept that and the activism. I mean, the crowds we see now on 26th of January, where we're seeing bigger turnouts at walking across a bridge in Brisbane than we do at South Bank at the beach, that has come through years of black resistance and leadership and persistence. And each year those crowds build. And so there's something beautiful about black resistance, even in the most conservative and most challenging times, because that's when it happens, of course. So we clearly see a movement around particularly Invasion Day and whether it's celebrated. Um, the, the polls are suggesting that increasingly people aren't celebrating the event and feel a bit embarrassed to celebrate it. So there has been a change, certainly, I can see in, in my brief lifetime. But we are in a very conservative time politically and I think mm. that people here are very complacent and don't realise how bad it is. We, look, we love to look to Trump and look overseas and look at the terrible things that are said over there because we can see it. But for some reason, we can't see it in our own backyard in the same kind of way. And you're about to head off just now uh, to to go and get ready to, to march on on January 26th as we're speaking. So you are still able to, to turn this day in some way into something that can be a positive for, for your own community. So, I mean, it's it's about, um, for me, um, coming together with MOB, uh, for my kids to, 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 to have some conversations around um, thinking about their location in, the, in this world. And, you know, I have kids ranging from well, 18, 18 through to 10-year-old twins. And it's always been a challenge for me to how to raise kids in a world in which that's predicated upon their non-existence. And I have to think about how do I give them access to things to make them able to navigate the world but also understand its limitations and its violence at times as well. Um, so for me, this is also about um, raising my kids right by get their understanding about the social world that they're entering into and also their responsibility as people in this place, um, that we all have a responsibility to make this place better for everyone. This is not necessarily an Aboriginal issue, but it is. So, yeah, so today is an important day just uh, for family, for community, um, to remind us of our strength and our power in spite of it all, to remember those that have gone before us who have made amazing sacrifices for us to be here, to have some of the opportunities that that we do have to even be here. You know, my great-grandmother had to hide out across the New South Wales border in the bush when the government officials would come to take the children. I have to remember and retell the stories of our own survival and our families and remember that that behaviour is needs to be ongoing for us if we're going to survive in space. Yeah, um, it's, a, yeah. It's, it's a huge job, but the work goes on. <laughs> Thank you for making the time for us today in, in those circumstances as well. Dr Chelsea Ortega, it's been a pleasure to have you on The Final Word. Thank you for having me. This is The Final Word with Jeff Lemon and Adam Collins. Thank you to our guest before the break, Dr Chelsea Wattago, who made time for us on January 26th, which is a big ask for uh, someone who has a lot of work to do on that day and had to wrangle various members of her family to get down to the march in Brisbane and all the rest of it. Um, and, yeah, just just such a refreshing perspective to... To, to hear about it without the kind of cynical filter bullshit of newspaper op-ed writers and the, the sort of endless circularity of the, con the, the conversation as it's sort of framed, um, that you just feel like you're eating the same stale toast over and over again. 
Yeah, I've seen a number of people posting today uh, that we should use this public holiday, as it is in Australia, for the 26th of January to educate ourselves about uh, the plight of Indigenous Australians. And uh, I think for our part, uh, we, we received some education there from Chelsea, all, all the more important. So uh, thanks to her for, again, uh, making time on what's always a busy day. We, we're going to get into the other bits of cricket uh, around the world, the matches that have been being played, but uh, we, maybe time for a little game first. What do you reckon, Adam? I reckon. A little, uh, little like, throw, throw a little frisbee, um, a little internet frisbee down, down the line. Let's do that via the medium of Nerd Pledge. I'm outside today, so I can really uh, let loose on that one. Nerd Very Pledge good. is the game we play with people on our patron page. Um, they're very nice and they help us keep the show going by subscribing to it financially. Uh, but they don't just send a normal amount of money. They send an amount of money that relates to a cricketing number and we have to work out what that number is. You know, you know the truth. I do, you know I do. I, I realised last week when watching back our first weekly episode on YouTube, which if you're listening to the podcast mm. and want to watch Jeff on a balcony and me with a number of books behind me which I don't own I'm, I'm, I'm in the uh, apartment of someone else who's very well read uh, that um, but are you going to get on that that Twitter account with like um, the bookcases that just has pictures of people with bookcases in their background on zoom calls? If, if I was lucky enough to get um, a Guernsey on that on the back of being in front of someone else's bookcase I'd feel quite guilty but possibly um, but no last week it became apparent to me that um, other people picked up on us looking at our screens very closely when going through Nerd Pledge. Yes, we do our research beforehand. No, we don't do this off the top of our heads, which, you know, it's probably obvious, but this, I mean, this, this gives that, away the magic. It would be bit. frankly insane. <laughs> it, <laughs> like, like, okay, we do some bits off the top of our heads yeah, when we sure. see the number and we know what it is. Um, but, you know, we, even, uh, even for those ones, we then want to take some other notes about more interesting things, more detail. You don't want to just go, oh, 375, Brian, Lara made 375. It's like, okay, well, what else can I tell you about 375? What else is interesting exactly. about it? So, you know, that's what the game's about. So the first number comes in from Peter Halton, mm -hmm. and that number is $2.24, and there's a clue that comes with it. You don't have to send a clue. Don't don't, don't get us wrong. There's no, no um, prerequisite. Peter has decided to, and the clue said, best bowling figures for someone best known as a batsman who I've greatly enjoyed watching on the Blast streams this summer, which I assume refers to the English T20 competition, which means that you, Adam, will have a much better idea of what Peter is talking about than me as someone who watched quite a bit of Blast, where I did not. Yeah, well, I originally thought it might be a Blast stream that I was working on, so I had a look through the Middlesex numbers. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe Stevie Eskenazi, but his best bowling figures uh, are not two for 24. Uh, his only bowling figures are, are none for four from 12 balls in his, I guess, now long <laughs> professional career. Uh, I thought about Daniel Bell Drummond. I spent a lot of time watching and talking about Deebs uh, through the summer, through the blast, but no, his best bowling across the three formats are two for six, two for 22, and two for 19. Then I kind of went through all of the batting stars uh, in the comp uh, last year and I didn't quite sort of jump out. Jeff, you had a look at Marchant De Longa um, at, 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 at Glamorgan and uh, his best bowling figures are two for 26. You thought that was the number, not two for 24. But um, in the case of... Yeah, I, I was just researching the wrong number. And so I very <laughs> excitedly was like, yeah, I've got him. Here he is. Uh, it was not Marchant De Longa. Yeah, well, he did play um, in the Quarantine yeah. Cup uh, winning team uh, last year, uh, which was, uh, okay. I think Daniel Norcross and I commentated the final where... Um, Glamorgan uh, mm. won the trophy, as it were. Uh, I think I was like referring to it being as proud as the moment when they won the county championship back in 1948. Not sure whether that was appreciated by Glamorgan <laughs> fans, um, but that's what we were doing in lockdown. So that no, wasn't him. Uh, but in the end, Jeff, you got you, you got it. You nailed it. I think I, I did in the end. Look, I did. I, I think I did it via a circuitous route um, because initially, you know, I was looking at professional T20 domestic figures and then I was looking at internationals of other formats and I was looking at tests and I couldn't find anything there. Doug Walter's best figures in one day international cricket were two for 24. The great partnership breaker. <laughs> I don't think Dougie was um, involved in the blast um, so I ruled Doug out. Um, in test cricket, Tent, Co Tent Copeland, <laughs> the great camping supplies advisor, <laughs> Tent Copeland. Um, Trent Copeland and Stuart Binney, the Indian all-rounder, both had best figures of two for 24 in, okay. in test cricket. Um, in T20 internationals, though, this is where it starts to get really spicy. One, Gulbadeen Naib, 
the <laughs> Afghanistan very very short term captain and amateur bodybuilder, um, the great Gilbertine, who the man for any any occasion, all seasons, any job, whatever you've got, he'll try to fix it. Um, also, Peter Siddle, best figures in T Twenty Internationals, two for twenty four. Didn't play a lot of them, but um, decent figures from Peter. Might Siddle. play some more, Peter. And, Siddle, uh, I, I gather. I mean, I, I, it can't be said that I watch a lot of Big Bash, but occasionally it's been it's been put to me that Peter Siddle's bowling very nicely in the Big Bash, and maybe he might have to go to India for the T20 World Cup later in the Got to go to India. He's got to go to India. You've got to get Peter Siddle on the plane to India. He's one of the 63 players who've got to go. Um, But then I found the man who I think it actually is, a man who did play in the T20 Blast and has best international figures of two for 24, Luke Wright, formerly of the Melbourne Stars and um, more recently of County cricket in England. Uh, Luke Wright would fit the bill, would he not? Yep, had a good season with Sussex and uh, keeps on keeping on so uh, I'm sure that will be right uh, Luke Wright. Uh, yeah, best bowling two for 24. Who knew? Not me. So thank you Peter Holton for bringing that to our attention. Jeff next up. Our next number Adam comes from Jesse G regular pledger, regular editor um, the latest number $1.68 what does it suggest to you? One six eight. go for gold. Well in terms of test scores I Trotty at, at Melbourne 10 summers ago, uh, the 10-11 Ashes test at the MCG when Australia all at 98, but and we often get pledges about all at 98 in different forms. We've got a 10-98 in there mm. somewhere, an- another 0.98. So there, there, there are, they, they exist, uh, those types of numbers. But it was the next day when they really drove Australia into the dirt, courtesy of Jonathan Trott, who made an unbeaten 168. I think from memory he was out relatively early leg before wicket to Peter Siddle, but Sids had overstepped and it was one of those very early um, retrospective no balls that was uh, checked by mm. the third umpire. I'm pretty right. I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that. So, but yeah, his 168, one of three centuries he made against Australia, one at Brisbane, and his 116 at the Oval uh, on debut back in 2009 as a 28 year old. And we've talked a lot about that. I guess it was the year before last when Felix White and Barney Douglas were on the final word discussing their documentary, The Edge, and Jonathan Trott was the star of that show in, in many respects, and uh, we got a much better understanding of what that taboo innings meant to him and also uh, what it meant to him uh, making big runs uh, on the MCG in a, in a series-defining test match. So that was my mm. first thought, Jeff. Okay, I like it. Um be, you know, I know, I know. Jesse's a Jesse's an, an American cricket follower with a relatively recent sort of entree into the game, so that might fall within that sort yeah. of bracket. Um, and and a, a famous away win, which you know, not that many teams come to Australia and and win. It would have been England then, and then South Africa um, a couple of times, and and India's more more yep. recent one. So I suppose there've been what five in the last ten years, which is more than would have been the case in the ten years before that. I'd be willing to bet more in the more in the previous. Uh, I mean, if you want to go back, I mean, when would have been the last time that Australia lost five series? You'd have to go back a very long span for five series at home before that. Ninety two, ninety three, and before ninety two, ninety three, you're probably looking at New Zealand in. 85, 86. Anyway, long time, long time. Um, yeah. Right, next. Uh, oh, yeah, 86, 87. The Ashes 2 and then 82, 83. I don't know. There, there were a few in the 80s. But anyway, anyway, conversation for another yeah. day. Um, so if, maybe not since the 80s. If Jesse's a big fan of um, of the history of the game, he might, he might have looked at Keith Miller. Keith Miller was the uh, 168th Australian to play Test cricket, of course, picking up 170 mm. scouts at 22 and a bit. Mm. Seven test hundreds, averaged 35, played 50 games for St Kilda before the war and just at the start of the war as well, I think, played footy for Victoria. The great all-rounder, as he was known um, across the board, really, uh, and one of the, I suppose, most well-known Australian cricketers in England uh, as well for his exploits mm. in 1948 and beyond. So if it's potentially Jesse going back and looking at some of the more high-profile players from the history of the game, that might have led into Keith Miller. Did Keith Miller get a gig on on The Crown on the Netflix series oh, The Crown? Did <laughs> Keith Miller a have point. a cameo? That's, he didn't, but I mean, I suppose in um, I'm not sure which tour that was alleged um, to have taken place, where he made acquaintance with Princess Margaret. Mm. Was it? That probably wouldn't have been 48. She might have been a fraction on the young side then, maybe possibly. But certainly by the time he toured. Uh, in the 50s, I suppose uh, that would have all lined up. Um, I'm sure someone will correct mm. us and let us know when he allegedly spent the night at Buckingham Palace. 
Well, I, I'm just thinking post with the, the Elizabeth's coronation is in 53. 52. So, you know, 50 was it 52? Oh, sure I reckon I was at the I was at the uh, I was at one of the jubilees in 2012. It would have been the 60th. Uh, I mean, okay. by that I mean I wasn't physically there. I was in I was in London at the time. So anyway, so around that time she, she gets coronated. Yeah. So so I reckon after the the the, the story wouldn't be as as punchy, you know, in, unless it were after um, that's she'd, true. She'd risen to the throne. So it's probably post probably mid 50s is is where we're looking. Okay. Um, I, I reckon, but. Yeah, I do, it's, it's been coming up on the screen um, here where I've been staying. They've, they've been watching the Crown a fair bit, so I was just wondering if Keith Miller got a got a Guernsey, but um, but sadly not. Our final number for the day comes from James Ralston. The number is one dollar twenty two. There's a clue for this one as well. James says refers to the most amazing inning as I have seen live at Adelaide Oval in the last 10 years, which at this point you're thinking, well, this is a moral. We're going to get this in four seconds. But, says James, the innings was not 122. So it relates to 122 in some way. What have you got, Adam? Well, I went through all the, the major test innings played at Adelaide in the last decade. So, for example, Ponting's double in 2011, his last great day in mm-hmm. test cricket. There was Faf Duplessis and AB de Villiers. His last, 20- last century, wasn't it? Last century. Yeah, the great escape for South Africa in 2012 with Faf on debut. Mm. Haddon and Clark in 2013. Uh, Warner, Smith and Clark in that famous test match in, in 2014. I suppose there'd be Virat Kohli twin mm-hmm. puns into that too. Usman 2016, Sean Marsh 2017, Chiteshwa Pajara 2018, yeah. David Warner's triple in 2019. And I went trawling the cards for any reference to mm. 122 and, you know, boundaries divisible into that and it didn't quite tally. So I threw it back to you mm. on the basis that I, 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 I've given up. Right. Well, fair enough. Um, in the South African Great Escape game, Graham Smith did make 122 in the first innings. Uh, oh. As well, but it's it's I should have it's, checked it's that. not a score of 122. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, but it's not a 122 score, so that couldn't have been it. Sure, um, yeah. Michael Michael Klinger made a Ryobi Cup hundred off 122 balls in 2011. You'll be pleased to know. He should still be playing for um, Australia. Oh, okay. Remember that yeah. when we first started making the podcast in 2015. That was yeah. I mean, before the before the uh, our selection concerns about Glenn Maxwell. They were they were the, 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 the hmm. selection concerns about Michael Klinger. But anyway, we moved on. Yeah. Klinger, Klinger must play, um, <laughs> hashtag. But he did at least at least get those couple of games for Australia in, in the T20 format. So I don't think it is Klinger's Ryobi Cup ton, although, you know, not that many players would have a Ryobi Cup 100 as opposed to a, a Mercantile Mutual Cup 100 <laughs> or, a, or a Matador Barbecues 100. You know, so if, you, if you've got a Ryobi ton, that's probably a pretty select group. Um, so I, I was looking at some other options here. One, I thought it could be Mitchell Santner's very fun test debut. You would remember in 2015, the first yes. pink ball test. Um, Mitchell Santner came in. He made 30-odd in the first innings um, and looked enterprising. Came up the order to number six in the second innings and made 45. I think he top scored. Um, hit that big six over midwicket, used his feet, carved some boundaries through backward point, looked the goods. You know, looked like a lot of fun. Batted through five partnerships and, and got New Zealand up to that lead of 170 or so that um, came quite close to winning them the match. They, they only lost, you know, well, Australia was seven wickets down, I think, or eight, seven or eight down when they chased them. Yep. So <coughs> that. Mi- that Mitchell Santner innings took 122 minutes. Um, so there's that. I mean, you, you would remember that knock yeah. quite fondly. I, I think he hit a six over point as well. Maybe that was in the in the first innings. But yeah, certainly when we were watching him then as a 21 year old, we we're like, this guy's going to be here yeah. quite a lot in Australia, and looking forward to watching his career. And I, and I suppose he will be in white ball cricket. I don't know when he'll get the next chance to visit as a Test player. He came last year and. I don't know whether Mitchell Stantner would be seen as a player fulfilling his potential as yet, but he's definitely very important to their white ball hopes, and I suppose there's a chance he'll be part of that two-test match tour to England that we'll talk about in a little bit. Maybe just starting to fulfil that potential in test cricket, I think that him him with the ball closing out that test against Pakistan recently... That's true. Is quite a big moment. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's that's sort of him doing the job in Test cricket. Um, you know, maybe maybe for the first time being 
being the influential player in that moment. So, so there was that in 122 minutes. Um, another little flight of fancy I had was I thought maybe if I'm looking at it not as 122 but as 1-2-2. One, 1-2-2. Two, two. One, two, two. That's the way that David Warner scores runs these days. You know, Not a lot of boundaries. Picks up singles, picks up doubles. Singles, doubles, singles, doubles. And when he made that triple a couple of years ago, um, he made, what, uh, 150 odd of the runs 160 odd of the runs in boundaries which means he made 173 of the runs by running up and down the pitch ones twos and threes so I calculated that that's 3,806 yards minimum <laughs> meaning 3.48 kilometres that he did just between the wickets um, that's not quite that as far as so I would one, think two, I, would, two. I would have thought that you would do mm. more than 3.4 kilometres if you're batting for that long when you certainly when you hear that uh, outfielders in a in a one day international can do ten kilometres on the rope. If you're Chris Wokes or Glenn Maxwell riding the mm. boundary, that it can be a ten k jaunt across fifty overs. I'm kind of surprised yeah. that Warner only did three point four k's, given he would do that in about twelve minutes if you put him on the tan track. Yeah, well, I mean, the, a batsman would do a lot more than that if you you know had the device on them because they'd be backing up every ball. That's they'd true. be you know. Get it, coming up and getting back into the crease, they'd be advancing down the wicket. They'd be setting off for runs and turning back. Um, you know, there'd, there'd be a lot of extras, but but that's just purely on the twenty-two yards between the okay. running creases. Um, minimum three point four eight k's, but it's probably not one two two in that sense. What it probably is is another David Warner number. In 2019, when David Warner made an even 100 against Sri Lanka in a T20 game, one of those late season white ball games that got him the Allen Border medal ahead of Steve Smith because he kept being best on ground in every <laughs> T20 match that Australia played. Um, his opening stand with Aaron Finch was 122. They made that inside 11 overs, so 65 balls. They had 122 on the board for the opening partnership. And Warner went on to make 100, and that, I'm going to bet you, is the number from James Ralston uh, referring to the most amazing innings he has seen live. That stands to reason. Well deduced, Jeff, and thank you, James, for an excellent clue. Also, thanks again to Jesse G and to Peter Holton for being part of it. Patreon.com forward slash the final word. Uh, we mentioned the Marcus Stoinis interview off the top uh, today, which was awesome. Also lovely, the fact that a number of people then joined our Patreon page and made you know, comments on there about how uh, the reason why they got on board was listening to uh, our chat with Marcus. So um, if you want to be part of what we're doing and contribute to helping us make more and more of what we're doing in 2021, patreon.com forward slash the final word, submit a nerd pledge. And if you don't want to submit a nerd pledge, you can submit a Julio pledge. And if you don't know what that means, uh, listen to Storytime 31, which was out last weekend. A Julio pledge in short is where you give us a, a round number as opposed to a, a cricket related number. We're there for all types. Mm. Anyone that wants to, types, any we'll type take of story. Anytime you want to be involved, we can find a way to do it. So, at the end of Nerd Pledge, Sri Lanka, England, um, quite. Quite a, an entertaining series in its way. This one, there were there were moments where it looked like this was going to be a walkover, and then it ended up not being. You know, we had some people chipping us for saying that um, England had a, a nervous end to the first Test match, but they lost three wickets for about two runs um, with about fifteen on the board. So I, even though they were chasing seventy odd, it was nervous at that point. There was a chance that England could have lost that first test. And then the second test, you know, the Sri Lankan collapse didn't come until their second innings. So there were a couple of strong first innings put up. Sri Lanka getting up to a big lead with another Angelo Matthews ton, and then Joe Root having to really dig deep, you know, two games in a row to make that hundred and eighty and dig England out of what could have ended up being a fair bit of trouble and then England bouncing back to bowl at Sri Lanka cheaply and managing to chase the target uh, four wickets down I think it was in the end so a series where a lot went on fascinating series uh, I, I just loved it uh, the fact that we could watch that contrast between uh, what we saw in Australia at the Gabba between Australia and India and then and then sort of flick to Sri Lanka, England, and that continued to the second test where Sri Lanka did a fine job early on. It was kind of a lopsided series in many respects. There were excellent days for Sri Lanka and excellent days for England where one side would dominate and it kind of switched session on session uh, on that final fourth and final day uh, yesterday where England finally got over the line. But some brilliant individual performances. Let's start with Joe Root, Jeff. I mean, across the series, he backs up a, a double uh, in the first test with uh, 186 in the second. He was already a C-bus super performer of the week, but 
Um, yeah, his, his test batting average is now above his test bowling average. He picked up two wickets at the very end of Sri Lanka's second innings, which is just trivia, really. But to say that he's right on the cusp of averaging 50 again in test cricket. I think he was eighth in the all-time run scorers list for England at the start of the innings, and he was fifth by the end. He overtook uh, Boycott and Gower and one other. I can't yeah. quite put my finger on, but still, he's, he's sort of motoring on through and all things being equal, given the volume of test cricket that England will play in 2021. He'll, he'll only have Alistair Cook ahead of him with Graham Cooch currently second on 8,900. He should have him uh, in, his, uh, in his back pocket uh, before the end of 2021. So that's the individual stuff. But Root, from a stylistic perspective, the way that he was so readily able to um, not only dance and sweep and shots that we're used to in, uh, I suppose, uh, spinning conditions, but the reverse sweep, the switch hits he was playing, um, it really was a, an utter joy. And he never looked remotely in danger. I mean, as far as I'm aware, I'm pretty sure it was chanceless, really. Um, and it was a different game when he was facing the spinners too. He, he never looked like he was going to get himself in strife compared to his colleagues who had trouble throughout the, the test match with the ball turning out of the rough and puffing out of the dust. So, well, not puffing out of the mm. dust, but um, balls puffing with dust and thus hard to pick up and hard to play, especially in that second inning. So, puff, 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 and puff, puff, puff in the dust, puff yeah. in the dust. So I just think that the root performance was just one of the, really one of the all-time great innings I've seen in Sri Lanka, given at one stage he was on track for the Bannerman too, it must be said. He was... Uh, uh, before Joss Butler mm. arrived and made a, a, a brisk half century, um, Root was really looking. You're never going to get a Bannerman with not, not with Joss Butler. In well, this is what I said like, at the time. I'm like, like anyway, yeah. a lot of people emailed me on the Guardian Life blog to say that, saying, "Oh, the Bannerman's on," and I'm like, "Well, you got to remember, if you're with Joss Butler, you need him to get out almost in the in the, in the first." 20 balls yep. he faces or it's just not going to play out that way. But still, I think he hit 55% of England's runs or something like that uh, in, in, their sec- mm. in their first innings rather and, uh, and finishes uh, the series uh, batting as well as he's ever batted. I was particularly interested in the, the Crickviz analysis that he was playing the ball closer to the pitch of the ball than he'd ever played it before. He was so um, judicious with his foot movement with coming down the wicket to the pitch whenever he wanted to, that he was striking the ball less than a metre after it had pitched on average, where you know normally the, the point of impact might be closer to two metres um, after the ball's pitched. So that gives you so much more control against spin. If you can be close to where the ball has landed, you're reducing its chance to deviate and thus draw a false shot so you know that was that was quite extraordinary but to be able to keep that up that level of concentration for those two really long innings back to back um, and to do it in you know pretty hot and oppressive conditions we've both toured Sri Lanka and it's a it's a very sticky sort of warm place to to be out there for hours on end trying to maintain that concentration it's a it's a prodigious effort to put those two innings together back to back. Yeah, and Emble Denia is a is a star. At 24 years of age, taking 10 wickets in the match, making runs as well. You look at the contrast. He takes 10 wickets, 10 English wickets across the across the match. Seven in the first innings, three out of four, or the second time around. So yeah, the, the 10 out of 14 for Sri Lanka across the board. Um, but Root, by contrast, in the series made 200 runs against the left arm spinner going at five and over. So, you know, Sri Lanka's best bowler couldn't keep Root at bay, which is why England win the series. But Mm. exciting that we have another uh, finger spinner from Sri Lanka who can not only beat right-handers on the outside edge and give it a huge rip, but beat them on the inside edge. We saw a number of times off the index finger, I suppose, with that old-fashioned arm ball or sometimes even hitting the shiny side, which is a different thing altogether. That's not an arm ball. That's intentionally making sure Mm. the ball doesn't hit the seam. Uh, that, that was the undoing yep. of a number of English players too. So um, great to see another young spinner. He's played about eight or nine test matches now, I think it is. And uh, that was a series that a lot of people were watching, of course. And uh, hopefully it's the start of something special for him. Yeah, I mean, you, you just... I'm, I'm so reticent to jump on that when he, he a left-arm spinner takes a few wickets and everyone says, oh, here's the replacement for Rangana Herath, you know bloke who took 436 i think it's <laughs> the the idea that you can just turn into that player um is is unreasonable um so i i hope he's given the space to actually become who he is as a player instead of having to be the next whoever it is yep. um but yeah sri lanka have have that that situation they're in where they have been 
you know, grasping for replacements for some of their some of their past greats. And Angelo Matthews is, you know, must be getting close to the end, you would think, although he's still um, turning in really consistent performances with the bat. But it's... It, it must be hard being him in that Sri Lankan team at the moment and you know probably feeling like he has to hang on for as long as possible because they need him you know they still need him really badly in that side yeah we skipped over the the first innings there didn't we Matthews making 100 and James Anderson six for 40 off about 30 overs or something ridiculous uh, um, just a stunning performance from Anderson especially on the first day when he was able to not only take three wickets but keep the run rate in control, which meant that uh, on the second day when they picked up early wickets, they were right back on top. Dilwaran, Dilwaran, I can never, I can never pronounce his name. Dilruwan. Dilruwan Pereira um, was able to make a half century himself and, and push back, and uh, Dick Weller as well. I mean, Dick Weller has net passed 50, 16 times in Test cricket yet to make a century, but his chat was. Um, was was great throughout the wicketkeeper and generally what a fantastic competitor that he is. But uh, yeah, Anderson six for forty. I crunched the numbers earlier today that he's taken one hundred and twenty six wickets since his thirty fifth birthday at an average of twenty point five. So that's right alongside Richard Hadley who picked up one hundred and sixteen Test wickets at twenty one point four after that 35th birthday. I think Jared Kimber um, looked at those two bowlers recently as well. Mm. So um, you can see that there's still plenty there for Anderson, who just bowls with such immaculate control. And, um, you know, again, dispelling the idea that he's only worth a pinch of shit when he's bowling on a green top in the Midlands in, you know, with a Duke's ball. Well, this couldn't have been uh, in, in more contrast to that. And he's done it yet again. So the expectation, I suppose, Jeff, is that we will see James Anderson in some capacity in the Ashes later this year and they have of course four test matches coming up in India that he'll play some role in I suppose in rotation with Stuart Broad but so long as they manage him and, and get in the test cricket that he needs mm. and, and, the, and the miles in the legs as they talk about he's still got the skill Yeah, the, the Anderson in Asia skill you know, if, if anyone who actually knows anything about cricket that hasn't been up for discussion, no. you know, for probably ten years. He's he's a bowler who who found a way to prosper even in the UAE. Um, who managed to get reverse swing to work for him to um, work out how to bowl those sort of cross seam cutters and so on that work on slower surfaces. And you know that is that is something that he's been able to do in the past. Probably Anderson in Australia is is the the last remaining question mark. Where you know he's had a couple of good days in Australia, but they have tended to be conditions dependent rather than you know Anderson on a flat Australian track hasn't really had the answers um, so that's that's still going to be the interesting one I think he you know he may well prosper in India he could take a bag in India but that I don't think means anything ahead of the ashes yeah I, I suppose if they're savvy about it and they use him with a pink ball at Adelaide I mean more power to them that that mm. seems to be quite logical yeah. why wouldn't you use James Anderson in those yeah. conditions or indeed at, at Brisbane if, if, it, if it looks right I mean not every um, Brisbane test match would be the right one mm. to, to play uh, Anderson I suppose at the moment at this stage of his career but um, if it's a if it's a pitch that looks mm. like it's going to give you plenty and you're going to back yourself early on in the, in the match then he, he may be a factor there too um, Dom Sibley made a half century an unbeaten half century uh, in the fourth innings after being on three occasions uh, the beneficiary of umpire's call so um, three times Emil Denia um, had him given not out leg before and three times it was umpire's call so umpire Damasena um, was looking after Dom there to an extent it, it, there, there were a lot of uh, bits of umpiring in that test that raised eyebrows not least when the third umpire was advising the on-field officials to overturn their decisions when they weren't meant to and vice versa it was all a bit all a bit sketchy umpire Hannibal was his name the bloke in the TV booth but um, they're through it and, and the series is over and yeah, there he, no major he had, the, he had that terrible he had that terrible idea about the elephants like Surely that bloke is not to be trusted. Like, you can, well, I just take elephants over the Alps. Good idea, Hannibal. You genius. Now they've made him a third umpire. Elephant in the room. Uh, last thing I'll say about this, uh, Jeff, is that uh, Josh Butler's averaging 55 since the, last, the start of last year. He was really important. So in that fourth innings, England still need... 
oh, 100 or so, maybe around that mark after they lose their fourth wicket. And you're thinking, here we go. This could be after taking all 10 Sri Lankan wickets in the first two sessions, they might uh, get bowled out in the third on, on day four, given the way it was trending. But Butler was the perfect bloke to come in, much as it was at Manchester last year, the first, uh, the first test against Pakistan, where he showed complete calm, but also batted at a tempo, which meant that when you're only chasing a small total, if Butler gets away from you in that scenario, it's kind of all over. And again, those white ball skills we saw on display, uh, reversing from the outset, reversing the way that most people use the conventional sweep to get one to deep backward point time and time again and occasionally hitting forward a square to the boundary rope. So Butler's record is formidable at the moment. And unfortunately for England, that's the... That's the player we won't see much of in India. He's going to play the first test match, then he's going home to miss the next three to rest and recuperate before coming back into the bubble for their stretch of white ball cricket. So Bairstow's going home now and coming back for test three and test four. Butler will play test one and miss th- two, three and four. And presumably that means Wokes will keep in the second test match regardless as the only wicket keeper in the party who'll be there for the second test. In fact, they've got they've got another keeper there with them. Folks. But, but folks will certainly keep in the second test. Um, but well, I suppose it's a bit quirky. Just at that, at initially... Initially, you said that Chris Wokes would be keeping oh, the second I? test. I, I, I definitely be, meant... That, that would be very inventive from yes. Ed Smith. No, I, I definitely meant Ben Folks. But no, it does mean that two of their better <laughs> white ball players in Bairstow, who had an okay series, it must be said, and Butler, who's going very nicely, um, for different chunks mm. of the series, they, well, certainly they won't play together. And for one of the tests, neither will be available. So it's going to make for some interesting mm. selection decisions by uh, Ed Smith and, and James Taylor. But um, I suppose they're taking the long lens to a year where they're playing loads of test cricket. And we found out this week two more. They're going to play New Zealand at Lords and at Edgbaston in June. That's outside of the World Test Championship. It's just a bespoke bilateral they've chucked in there, presumably because in, from New Zealand's perspective, they may be playing in a World Test Championship final at the end of June. So why not play two test matches? is ahead of that and be in the country better that than playing mm. a couple of first class fixtures I suppose and, and from England's perspective or well, their broadcasters um, two more home test matches means um, in some way making up for the lost revenue from 2020 when everything was a lot different so I suppose good for all of us as, as test cricket lovers that we'll get to see yeah. England and New Zealand for the first time since 2015 when they played a, a pulsating two match <laughs> affair um, before Australia arrived so that's good news Four more days. Four more days. That's what we want. Um, right, so England on their way to India shortly. Um, the World Test Championship yes. implications. Interesting. Um, so because of that, well, it's kind of bold by New Zealand to say, well, we'll schedule this anyway, you know, in case we make it because... We're, it's it's not putting a lot of faith in Australia to go and whitewash South Africa, I'll put it that way. Well, there's a few different implications here, uh, using that word again. So New Zealand are so well-placed not playing a game. They're, they're going to finish at 70%. So just going through it before, if England win 2-1 in India, they'll, they'll potentially make the final because it'll mean they've overtaken India and that'll mean Australia need to win mm. at least 2-0 with a draw or 3-0 to be sure. Um, but there's a scenario mm-hmm. where New Zealand play England. There's a scenario where um, England play Australia, conceivably. It would require Australia to win 2 or 3 nil. Actually, 3 nil. it must, I think it is, to go above 70% and overtake New Zealand. Uh, whilst England have need to beat India 3 nil and have one draw too. Unlikely, but they could still play each mm-hmm. other. Um, from India's perspective, they need to win 2-1 to make sure they, they stay above New Zealand. I think... 2-1 two, two, might actually drop them beneath New Zealand but above England. So mm. I suppose the point I'm making here is, is that in the two remaining series, in the seven remaining test matches, there's about seven combinations who might play at Lords, which I think is uh, uh, in the, in the, a tick for the WTC. Isn't that what, kind of what we wanted? We, we, one of the, and I know that's mm. easy to take the piss at the moment um, given it's being done by percentage. It's complicated. The points are all over the place and... You know, there's, there's a lack of consistency with how they've allocated points. But if you kind of step back from that and just evaluate it on the basis that we've got seven tests to go, four teams very much in it, and any combination can play anyone, hey, I think that's a good thing. Uh, and, and I suppose it'll yeah. mean uh, we'll be watching those two series even more closely than the otherwise would be because they'll, they'll, um, they'll, they'll have a direct effect on who plays at Lords. Hmm. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm loving this. It's like it's a you know the point about two weeks into the football World Cup where everyone's just become an expert on every global football team and they're all talking about all of the scenarios. Oh well, well, you know if Iran if Iran can get a draw against South Korea, then they'll go ahead on goal difference and they'll be into the quarters for this and that. Um, the uh, piece of really good news we have um, as the the reintroduction of international cricket to Pakistan continues. South Africa heading back to Pakistan. First time in 13 years and 10 months, which is the lifespan of many a good dog. Um, speaking of elephants earlier, Babar is back and will be captaining the side. Babar Azam, uh, Kisa Rabada back in the test team for South Africa. Good news for them. Um, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a strange 12 months or so since... KJ Rabada played a test match, and um, and and it's going ahead. There will be there will be test cricket in Pakistan against South Africa. Happy days. Yeah, consecutive days we're having uh, test cricket from the subcontinent. So it would have been clashing. This would have been the final day of England Sri Lanka, but uh, Pakistan and, and South Africa get that clear air. And this is in the World Test Championship as well. I should add, it's just that Pakistan and, and yeah. South Africa, and subsequently Bangladesh and the West Indies. I think is the other series taking place and then Sri Lanka and the West Indies if I've got all that in a straight line but none of those teams can make it so when I said before there's there's seven test matches left there's seven we're not test gonna as far gonna as make the, it uh, as far as the no final we're not concerned. gonna make it uh, but yes we're not <laughs> gonna make it to the final 13 years and 10 months and the, the last time they played it was at Karachi as well um Great stuff, all this. This is the Telford Vice was uh, making the point in his preview for Crick Buzz that so much has changed in cricket across that span of time. Think of it this way. T20 cricket was four years old uh, the last time that these teams played a test match in Pakistan. Mm. And now T20 cricket, well, we, we know how it influences uh, everything in, in international cricket. So um, I suppose great news for fans of Pakistan and South Africa and England. They'll get to watch this series on, on Sky Cricket. That's been, uh, the rights have been picked up. Um, unfortunately, that, that won't be the case in Australia. I think it's worth noting that the Sri Lanka-England series, the only way to watch it legally uh, was via a betting app, uh, which is bad news. If, uh, if this is the way this is going, if we're going to be uh, watching betting companies literally buy <laughs> the rights uh, and, and force you to their platforms, I think with sports bet last week, you needed to be you needed to have made a bet in the previous 24 hours or have a certain amount of money in their account, one, one or the other. But that's that's not great. If that's the price of entry to to our sport, then there's there's a misalignment there. So. I'm not sure what happens next on this front, but what I do know is that um, we won't be able to watch Pakistan and South Africa in Australia unless we've... Um, well, I'm not even sure. I'm not sure whether that betting company have got the rights to this, but it's unfortunately not going to be on television. Mm. Yeah, you can only watch the footy if you have a plunge on who's going to kick the first sausage <laughs> roll. Oh, gross. It's a slippery slope, isn't it? Gross, gross. Uh, it's not even no. It's it's at the bottom of a slippery slope into a fucking cesspit, like into a cracked open septic tank. It's disgusting. It's like, you know, swimming in the wrong parts of Port Phillip Bay and just mm. just just coming up covered in gunk. It's 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 rank um, and it's money and it's like the worst parts of sport, which are that really really shit house people and really shit house companies want a piece of it because there's money in it. Um, anything that people care about, there's money in it. So anything that means something that matters to human beings, there will be some fucking rank pricks out there looking to carve off a slice of it as cash. So, look, I, it's people like this who make me hope that maybe some of the religious theories are real. Maybe there is eternal suffering and damnation, <laughs> you know, and maybe... And, and if there is, maybe it'll be worth going just to see the other people who are down there. Um, but yeah. Well, at least we got to see. I mean, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Let's 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 look at the positive side of this. At least a couple of years ago, we got to see Pavel Florin on television. I mean, that was on TV in Australia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not, I suppose that's that's not always yeah. lost. That that wasn't that wasn't on a via a betting app though, was it? That was. I'm just making. I'm just drawing. That, I'm just drawing the contrast to what's available on television. You see. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, Pavel Florin was. Uh, did you see his um, winter training video? I did. Uh, I did in in the last week or so. 
yeah, batting, batting, bowling, catching practice in the snow, rolling around shirtless in the snow, doing push-ups, very sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger in Red Sonja. It's maybe one of my favourite shit American 80s movies things is they were like, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he can play a Russian. No worries. Sure, he's from Austria. Whatever. <laughs> Just do the accent. Put one of those big cat hats on him. Uh, it'll be fine. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so Pavel, was, was, he was really, really... Um, Living up to the the Eastern European um, standards, there. Respect to him, uh, Jeff. So that's taking place. Two Test matches, one in Karachi, I think, one in Royal Pindi, and that will be, mm-hmm. I think, the end of our conversation today. We're looking forward to that mm-hmm. series. We're looking forward to England uh, now moving on to India, Australia are going to be moving on to South Africa in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think we'll invest a bit more time uh, in our next weekly episode talking mm. about the, the whys and wherefores of that. Quite a bit going on right now behind the scenes, but none of it seems to be quite better down. So I expect we'll have more formal uh, type of announcement this week or next, and we might come back to it there. I, I was just thinking that the Royal Pindi Express should be a Wes Anderson movie as well as a Pakistani fast bowler. Um, you know, <laughs> like maybe maybe that's Shoaib's breakout role when maybe that's when he really, you know, finds out how much the camera loves him when Wes Anderson gets Shoaib in some like orangey pastel sort of background colours in a really like lingering close-up staring blankly into the camera. It'd be a good time. And speaking of staring This is blankly, a good time to finish the yeah, show. Yeah, it will be. I've got a little girl on the floor who's waving her arms at me wanting my attention, so best I go and do that. Yeah, go on. Get her on, get her on the cam. No, it's, get... just a, it's, it's, it's one stretch. Oh, maybe she'll crawl underneath the table here and join us. We'll see. In any case. Um, all right, we'll... all right. Well, what I will say is that this is the end of the final word today with Jeff Lemon and Adam Collins. Fortunately, if you enjoy the show, uh, we'll be back on the weekend with story time our cricket history show and we'll be back the following week with the weekly show because that's how it works much like monthly magazines um and we'll probably be back we're thinking of, there she is hello winnie we're thinking of doing um doing some daily shows for the india england series that might happen too so you know keep it keep an eye out for that um uh, the show is on the bad producer podcast network uh, jay Mueller and astrid edwards keep that going david collins is the editor uh, every time we put out one of these hi i just got a high and a wave <laughs> getting indeed. very advanced here very quickly <laughs> Um, and uh, thank you to everyone on Patreon who supports the show and makes it possible for us to do it. Also, CBUS Super and Wisden Cricket Monthly, who are uh, supporting us in their own ways week after week. It's been the final word. It's Winnie. She's delightful. You can hear her saying hi in the microphone. She's now worked out that word and is going to give it an absolute thrashing over the next few months, I imagine. That's us signing off. Bye. We'll see you next time.